Welcome to the Parsha Pairings with Jeff and Sherry. I'm Jeff Friedlander. And I'm Sherry Friedlander, and we're so glad you've joined us today. And we want to just remind you that you can go to uh, our YouTube channel and catch these videos there, or you can download the podcast on any of the places where you get your normal apps. Please be sure to like and share yep. and let everyone else know if you're being blessed by these teachings, share them with other people, and then leave a comment for us. We'd love to know what you're getting out and what you're gleaning from these teachings. All right, so this week we are in Parsha Kitavo, which means when you come in. And it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1 through 29, verse 9. Our Haftor reading this week is called uh, is out of Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 22. And the apostolic writings are Matthew chapter 4, 13 through 24, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, and Revelation 21, 10 through 27. This week we're digging into some chapters that are going to be kind of the big closing moments. It's not the end of the book yet, but it's kind of the closing moments. Because what happens this week is we're going to see some, some basic end of the practical, the tithing and some of that, which we'll talk about in a moment. But then we're going to get a concluding ceremony. We're going to get a place where the people are going to affirm we are in this covenant, and yeah. we have heard the covenant, and we accept the covenant, and we're ready to do it. Yeah. So this is kind of a big crescendo moment, <laughs> and then we'll have another crescendo next week. But this is a big crescendo moment. So yeah. we start out in chapter 26, and the opening line of this Parsha gives us a couple stipulations to follow as we're digging into uh, what the Lord wants to be done. Sherry, why don't you read in English the, the first couple uh, verses sure. there for us. It says, Now when you enter the land that Adonai your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it. And so the first part is, he says, When you enter the land, vehaya kitavo el haaretz. When you enter the land. So we understand that this promise and all the promises we're going to read about today are about entering into the land. Right. you you got to go and possess and boy we could spend right. probably our whole time today just talking about the idea that god gives covenants he gives blessings right. he gives opportunities but you always have to actually go if in go in i mean right. you have to take steps and go in and then he then what what she read was he says uh try that it's easy again. for you to say <laughs> Vyashav Taba, Vyashav Taba, which means, and you possess it and dwell in it. Right. So not only do you physically have to go and take the land, but once you get there, you have to possess it, it has to become yours, and then you've got to put down roots. You've got to permanently dwell there. Mm -hmm. So everything we're going to read now, everything we're going to kind of mm -hmm. discuss, is based on those two stipulations. Right. It's not before, it's not after, it's when you get there. Right. And the book right after the Torah is that first book of the prophets, which is Joshua. And right. it gives the account of the conquest of the land yeah. and where, where they go and how they do it. And in Joshua eleven twenty three, it tells us, So Joshua captured the whole country according to all that Adonai had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it as an inheritance mm. according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land had rest from war. So we know that there is a place. Yeah. Yeah. in the future where they're going to actually possess and they're, and it's actually a very short-lived possession to yeah. all the troubles kind of start coming yeah. um, but we do see that they in Joshua lets us know they do actually possess it and it takes about scholars think about five years for that to happen for them and, to possess it from north to south yeah. east to west and interestingly the land they possess is much bigger than the land of Israel today right and when they possess it we get further down the road in Joshua and we read that the promise that was made to Abram, this original land mm. promise, finally gets done. Joshua yes. does do it, and God provides, and they do actually possess Amen. and dwell in that land Amen. until they don't. But they did <laughs> for a, quite a while there. Okay, right. so uh, Deuteronomy 26 is going to outline the land they possess, and while they're in there, they're supposed to bring a, a bikurim offering, an offering of a bikurim is the first fruits of the land. Mm -hmm. So you wanna... Now, one of the things that's interesting when you talk about these first fruits, so this is an agricultural community, so right. this bickering really has to deal with their produce. Right. Now, if we 
juxtapose that against what we just read. This is about them being in possession of the land. So when they get there, there's already going to be crops that they're going to eat from. But if it's about five years before conquest, before full possession, mm -hmm. is when this kicks in. So we're thinking yeah. these first fruits of what they've planted yeah. and the increase from yeah. what God's given them from that possession. Something just hit me, Sherry, and I, I, we didn't talk about this previously, but it just hit me. Uh, there's a there's a well, ruling given, uh, and I can't remember. You might remember. It's either Deuteronomy or, or Numbers where when they go into the land, the first year they're not supposed to touch right. the trees. The second year uh, th they're supposed to plant, but right. they're not supposed to. They to eat from the produce. Eat from the produce, and, the, and then, then they plant the second year. Right. And then the third year they can actually begin to harvest right. those those trees. So we know if it took scholars, say, five years, right. it's at least five years where they did that. If the scholars are wrong, we know regardless, it's at least three right. years before they would have done it anyway because of that, that command alone. So somewhere in that area right. would have been the time frame. It's very interesting. So let's read what the instructions are about this bickering, starting in verse 2. You are to take some of the first of all the produce of the soil which you gather from your land that Adonai your God has given you. I love that God continues to remind them. You have the land, but I gave it to you. Don't forget that. Yeah. Put it in a basket and go to the place Adonai your God chooses, mm -hmm. that's key, to make his name dwell. You are to give it to the Kohen, the priest, in charge uh, in those days and say to him, I declare today to Adonai your God that I have entered the land of Adonai, swore to our fathers to give us. The Kohen is to take the basket from your hand and set it down before mm -hmm. the altar of Adonai your God. Then in the next verse, verse 5, we see that when they're presenting this offering, God actually gives a prayer that the worshiper mm -hmm. is to offer. It's one of only two of the prayers that we see God gives the worshiper is required to say. Yeah. We know the priests have things there to say, and God speaks to them, and the Levites, and gives yeah. them specific instructions. He's been giving Moses instructions. But here's one that the the worshiper is to say. And he says, Then you are to respond before Adonai your God. My father was a wandering Armean, and he went down to Egypt and lived there as an outsider, few in number. But there he became a great nation, mighty and numerous. Are you hearing it? Are you hearing what he's talking about, right? The Egyptians treated us badly, afflicted us, and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to Adonai, God of our fathers, and Adonai listened to our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. Then Adonai brought us out of Egypt, out from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us to this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. So now look, I have brought the first fruits of the soil that you have given me, Adonai, then you are to set it down before Adonai your God and worship before Adonai your God. You will rejoice in all the good that Adonai your God has given to you and to your house, you, the Levite, and the outsider in your midst. And interestingly, Sherry, this prayer, this, this script, if you will, that they're to say yeah. is also repeated in Leviticus when they're told to do this at Shavuot. So the festival of harvest of Shavuot, which really, is the, or the early harvest, really Bikarine begins in Shavuot. Is Shavuot, and that when they come to bring that offering, right. which is one of the three pilgrimage feasts, right. they are to say this exact phrase. So this is a major part of the culture God wanted to cultivate when yeah. they put, took possession. Well, interestingly, as you brought up, I hope you hear. What are we hearing? We're hearing these connections to Passover. Yes. This is part of what developed into tradition for the Passover Seder, yeah. where we remember what God has done. You know, Passover is the remembrance of our deliverance out of Egypt, but it's more so our spiritual deliverance out of our sin. Yeah. And so this pattern, patterns are so important in the scripture. And this pattern that we get is that as they're bringing these first fruits, they're to remember how they got here, why they got here, who brought them here, who blessed it, remembering that this is part of God's story. Yeah. It's not their story. It's yeah. God's story being told through them. So, and, so you just said we got a pattern here of, of Passover. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have Passover, but we also have, as I just mentioned, Shavuot. So what do we have here? We have the building of the uh, spring, spring feast, feast, right? That's We've got right. this idea of the beginning with Passover, the exodus. And moving forward, now we're seeing an offering 
the green, which is at Shavuot. So. And I think another thing to note that I thought about as I was reading this, you know, this prayer that they're praying, what a great thing for us to do is we bring offerings mm. to the Lord. Why? Because it reminds us of who our provider is. And I made a note that if I'm bringing this remembering God's mm. provision, I'm not going to be thinking, well, what have you done for me lately, God? <laughs> it's going to be like, Lord, thank you that yes. you have provided again and again for me. Yes. Then we switch gears out of the bicker this first fruits offering into what what is known as ma'aser, which is the tithe, tithe that you're to bring. So they're reminded of the laws of tithing, and, and there's a lot of, we're not going to go into the quote-unquote weeds of this because right. there's quite a bit of breakdown of this, but we'll give you a couple ideas, a couple uh, Hebrew words and kind of a big picture, uh, a few details, but I want you to gra- gather a big idea of what possibly is happening here. Mm-hmm. When added up over the time frame of the, the the regular tithe, the one year, the three year, the five year, or six year, all those tithes and offerings, it's estimated by scholars somewhere around twenty three and a half percent of income was given in this these, over the these, course of a over year. the course of this right. time in these offerings. And you say, well, that's a lot, but you have to understand why. It was not as we have reversed our tithe back to the simple of our cash going directly to right. a local congregation. The local congregation <clears throat> was mixed with the civil government. There was not this separation of church right. and state. The government didn't handle the stuff for people like health care and the poor right. and the widow. No, there was Israel. Right. Israel was the faith the community of faith, God, health care, the poor, the widow, the orphan. So this system of 23.5%, mm-hmm. if, it, if you will, was taking care of all the needs of the communities right. at large. It was designed to, right. whereas we give a big chunk of our income to our government and a small portion to our local congregation. Right. So it's a just just a different setup. That's one of the reasons it's a little confusing to us. Well, I think verse 12 really gives us the picture of what this was about. Mm-hmm. And when it tells us, when you finish tithing the full tenth of your produce in the third year, so there's this idea that there's a third year tithe, which, yeah. you know, that goes into a whole other teaching. Yeah. The year of the tithe, you are to give it to the Levite, to the outsider, mm. to the orphan, and to the widow, so that they may eat within your town gates and be satisfied. Mm. So there's this idea that, as you're saying, the scripture lays the pattern that this wasn't so that the the priest could get rich or the Levite could get rich. It was so it could be distributed and the poor among us could have food. The Levites could have food who didn't actually have a land inheritance. Right. And the outsider. And the outsider. (laughs) Which meant the one that's not even uh, agreeing to serve the God of Israel. They're saying, look, you're going to be in a a pagan land. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some people that are going to want to become part of Israel. There's going to be people that aren't going to become part of Israel, but you're going to live with them. They're your neighbors. And if they have a need, part of this tithe is to help take care of them as well because you're in charge. You're the ruler of the land. It's your responsibility to take care of people even if they don't agree with you. Well, and because the land is the provision. Yeah. And God wants us to steward the provision. Yeah. It's not for us. The provision is for the community, yeah. which is a very different mindset, West, different from our Western mindset. Yeah. But a couple of the, the, the tithing principles that we've read about in the past, just to kind of give us an idea of how vast the system yeah. is, we've already read about Terumah, mm-hmm. which is where um, you harvest a crop and one fiftieth of the yield was separated out for the Kohen. They got a one fiftieth of yeah. that tithe, uh, Terumah. Uh, the crop remainings, this is a, actually, and this is a principle that still exists mm-hmm. in Israel today. Yeah that you don't harvest all the way to the edges of your field. You actually leave a portion around the edges so that the poor can come and gather. This was the story of Ruth. This is how Ruth was taken care of, that Boaz had her, she wasn't one of his servants, so she wasn't gathering for him, but she was among the poor, and she was able to gather sheaves so that she and Naomi could eat. In fact, uh, there's, there's, you know, when you talk about the poor, it's so fascinating how good God is. He is. Because you think about, he, he tells them to leave the edges, as you just described. He also told them at another place, if you are carrying, like you would load your, your harvest up onto your wagons mm-hmm. and you would begin to carry them off the fields. 
any of it that fell off the wagon, you were required to leave it. Yeah. You couldn't go pick it up. Not because it was dirty. It was left for the poor. That right. somebody could come who had need and they could pick up what fell off. And then you had the prescribed tithe that you actually gave right. so that it could be. So multiple methodologies that God yeah. is saying, all of my people who have land are going to take care of those who don't. That's right. Well, and then you have, we have the ma'aser behema, which is the tithe of cattle. Mm -hmm. So that even not just your produce, your cattle, because this is part of the increase of what yeah. God's given you. Yeah. You've got your ma'aser oni, which is the third, sixth, and seven year Shemitah cycle tithes that are given um and these are again given to the poor to the levites and the strangers and uh, the interesting thing about these three is they're really they're not required in a specific place to go to yeah. it's just all the different layers of what god's yeah. done and then the one we're probably as you mentioned earlier the yeah. most familiar with is the ma'aser kesafim is when you would give a portion of the increase of whatever yeah. you sold we're used to this it's a tenth of the money basically yeah. but i think what we can really gather from god's system mm -hmm. is that we're not once we give that little 10 percent tithe check of whatever i receive yeah there is more to give and we call it offering a lot of times yeah. but really it's about taking care of the community taking care god has a system for taking care of the community and then one last thing I yeah. wanted to bring up, just tying Joshua yeah. back into our, our narrative of what happens once they're in the land. In the last chapter of Joshua, mm -hmm. Joshua 24, at the end of his life, it's so cool to me that as we're reading all of this Deuteronomy, we're seeing God gather the tribes yeah. and he's giving them the instructions. He's, he's here having them agree to... Yeah this Torah, which you're about to read about in a second, and at the end of Joshua's life, he does the same thing. After they've conquered the land, he calls the elders together to Shechem, and he recounts the history as Moses has taught him. Mm. He recounts the deliverance, and he calls them to obedience to the Torah, which the people say in Joshua 24, 24, we will worship none but Adonai our God, and we will obey none but his voice. Yeah. We will hear and we will do. Yeah. What this generation's fathers said at Sinai, this generation in the land agree yeah. again to the same thing. And that's what we get into when we come to chapter 27 and 28 of Deuteronomy. Right. The closure of that is what Sherry was just reading at the end of Joshua when the conquest has happened, and now... Moses is saying, okay, let's do a before and after. So the before right. is, here's what you need to do. Joshua 24 is, okay, you did it. Now, did it. now say it again, right? Yeah. So chapter 27 and 28, Moses is going to confirm and affirm the covenant that is being made with that generation that Sherry was just mm -hmm. speaking of uh, when they enter the land. And they do it on two mountains. They, right. There's a valley. When you come out of what is modern day, uh, the kingdom of Jordan, uh, which is the Jordan River comes down. Uh, off of Mount Hermon at the top mm -hmm. of Israel, flows into the Gat, what is uh, Lake Knesseret or the Galilee, Sea of Galilee, flows out of that and comes all the way down through the land. On the eastern side of that is now modern day the uh, country Jordan. of Jordan. Right. And that country. But back then, of course, it was not that. It was Moab. It was Moab. And as they came through that, that wilderness of Moab, they're going to come across, to cross over the Jordan into the land. They're going to come between a pass, and that pass has two mountains on either side. There's a valley through there, and those mountains are called Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And it's there in those two mountains, God's going to instruct them here, take six of the tribes and go on one of them, take the other six and go on the other, and on one of them you're going to talk about the blessings of God that are going to come upon you if you're obedient, and on the other one, we're going to talk about the curses from God that are going to happen if you're not obedient. So if we can read a little bit of this. What do you think? Just let's read, do, just let's a little read bit of this it, God, because I think I want to read about uh, Mount Ebal, because yeah. there's a lot of really great nuggets to pull right. out of that. Let's do that. Then. Uh, starting in verse uh, 20, uh, let's see what verse, verse 2. Now on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land that Adonai your God is giving you, you are to set up large stones for yourselves and coat them with plaster. Then you are to write on them all the words of this Torah when you cross over, so that you may enter the land that Adonai your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as Adonai the God of your fathers promised you. 
Now, when you cross over the Jordan, you're to set up these stones, which I am commanding you today on Mount Eval, and coat them with plaster. There also you will build an altar to Adonai your God, an altar of stones. You are not to use an iron tool on them. You are to build the altar of Adonai your God of whole stones, and you are to offer burnt offerings on it to Adonai your God. You are to sacrifice fellowship offerings and eat there, and you will rejoice before Adonai your God. You are to write on the stones all the words of the Torah very clearly. So powerful. All right. Now, a couple of things to note yep. out of this. What we'll learn in a little bit, what we read is we read the rest, you know, the next couple of verses is, as you said, you've got these two mountains, and six of the tribes are going to be on top of Mount Ebal, and they're going to be speaking out the curses, and we're going to talk about that. In just a minute, I want to show you some things about the, those words. And then you're going to have on Mount Gerizim, you're going to have six of the tribes speaking out the blessings. If you follow after the Lord and you do what he says, then you're going to get the blessings of God. The first note I want to make is about this time of them crossing. It says that they're going to go te'avru in Hebrew. This is a, this uh, is when they're, uh, it says when you cross over to the Jordan, te'avru. This prefix tav gives the idea that you shall cross over. What we talked about in the first part of 26, that you're going to go and possess the land. This is when you're going through, you're going you're gonna to possess it. Uh, and this is how you're to prepare it. You're to prepare this Mount Ebal with this altar. Now, this is what's so unique. The altar is only on Ebal. It's not on Gerizim. Why is that? Because when we obey the Torah, there's no need for sacrifice. It's just the blessings that flow. On Ebal, God knows, listen, if you don't follow my Torah, there is a requirement. Yeah for a sacrifice to be made. And he sets that up in their crossing as a picture for them yes. to see. Even if you disobey and these curses come on you, I still have korban. I still have a sacrificial system yeah. that I've shown you how you can still draw near to me. Yeah, the grace of God is mm, evident even so in this beautiful. description. It's beautiful. And one of the things, just as a note for you that love archaeology and history and those kinds of things, uh, on Mount Ebal, archaeologists have unearthed and discovered large stones. Mm. They have found stones that have a white plaster upon them. And they have discovered a, an ancient altar set up, a, a so, squared altar. So this idea, what was told here, has been uncovered archaeologically. And we yeah. don't have any stones that I'm aware of. There may be, I could be missing something, that actually have the words of the Torah on it. I don't know of any of those that actually have right. those. But we do have evidence that there was definitely this idea. What happened here certainly did happen on Mount Ebal. Absolutely. No question, which is incredible. It to verifies me. the scripture is true. And this is thousands and thousands of years ago. So, so yeah. when we get into verse 13, after they've established the tribes that are going to be on the different mountains, I want to look at this word curse. Yeah. Because it's, there's actually two Hebrew words for the word curse. Yeah. We tend to think of it one way, but the Hebrew always tells a different story yeah. or a little deeper story. So in verse 13, it says, For the curse, uh, for, for the curse, those who are to stand on Mount Ebal are Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulon, Dan, and Naphtali. So these are the ones that are going to stand yeah. there, and they're going to send out curses. That word curse there is uh, kelalal. And it means a, a vilification mm -hmm. or a trifling or it's kind of like I'm speaking a hex or, a, or evil of someone. Yeah. It's really a, kind of an accusation against somebody. Yeah. I'm putting something on them. Right. So yeah. as, as it's going forth, they're speaking forth. He says, I yeah. want you to you know, speak the curses, that what's going to happen if you don't listen to me. And the first time that we see that is in Genesis 27, 12, and 13. Mm. Jacob questions his mother, Rebecca, yeah. about her plan to deceive uh, Jacob. Yeah. And uh, and he worries. He'll be cursed. He says, if I do this, I'm going to be, uh, what's the word again? Kel Allah. Okay. I'm going to be Kel Allah. I'm going to be vilified before yeah. my father. I don't want to be vilified. I don't, want, I don't want him to curse me. I don't want him to put something on me. Now, the other word for curse is the one we commonly most relate mm -hmm. to in English, and it's arar, yeah. and it means to extricate, extricate or bind. Yeah. It's this idea of uh, being in shackles, being 
bound up by our stuff. It feels so much more permanent. It's not necessarily permanent, right. but it feels a lot more permanent in that way. Usually our modern understanding is, is to be damned or to be yeah. really... Um, it's pronounced something permanent, as you're saying. And this one's used a lot in the scripture. It's actually used more in the terms of uh, some pretty extreme cases, like right. the first one. The first <laughs> time we see it, The first it, right. time we see it's not good. No, right? the first time we see this word, aurora, yeah. is in Genesis 3.14. Yeah. The very first thing to yeah. be cursed on this planet was the nakash, yeah. the serpent. The serpent, yeah. The serpent was the first one cursed and in 314. And it's that word, the that, it's arar. That, it's, it's mm -hmm. arar. It's that, that tough one. And then we see it again in Genesis 3.17. Not only is the nakash, mm -hmm. uh, the nakash is, is cursed, but now God curses the land. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Genesis 3 account, there's only Adam and Eve are not cursed. No. Uh, but the land and the serpent are. And so we see the land is now cursed. And then we go forward from there. Then in Genesis 4.11, uh, we see that Cain is cursed. Right after the, the first yeah. fall, he's bound up. He's extricated. He's, he's in a place He can't of, break the shackle. Right. There's right? shackles on him. And then so interesting, we fast forward over to Genesis yeah. 9 and we get after Noah. The, after the flood. Come after the flood. We've had a lot of rebellion going on. Yeah. We've had a lot of bad stuff. We get Noah. Noah has a son named Ham. Ham does some terrible things, right? Mm -hmm. Ham uncovers Noah's nakedness, and then God curses Ham's son, uh, grandson, which right. is Canaan. Yeah, he curses him, basically, and he says, you will be a servant to Shem. Yeah. You will, and, and this is what then brings us into our current story. Yeah. So here's <laughs> the children of Israel. They've not possessed the land. Yeah. They've not. This is they're getting ready to go do that and coming full circle. Yeah. is these promises that God has made. Yeah. The promises that God made all the way back in Genesis. Yes. That there was going to be out of the out of the seed of the woman, there was going to be a deliverer. And yeah. this we're beginning to see the story unfold. Yeah. Because as they're getting ready to go in, they're taking possession of the land that was mm -hmm. cursed that now can be reversed by the blessings of God through obedience. And it's occupied by Canaanites, mm -hmm. which are the descendants of of the cursed grandson of Noah. So there's an opportunity yeah. for that curse to be reversed as well as it comes under the lordship yeah. and the obedience of God. So we're seeing as we peel back the story yeah. that God is setting things in motion for that Genesis yeah. reversal of the curse. That's exactly right. you got Canaan, as you said. You've got the land, as you said. Yeah. And now we're getting an opportunity to see Canaan and the land actually be brought back, back into redemption. Back into the state of blessing. And then we see it in, a, in another place, too, the Abrahamic covenant, which is the bigger covenant that not only deals with land, which right. is amazing, because in Abraham, he was given a land covenant. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give this land that you are now in, which is not yours. Right. I'm going to give it to your descendants for their possession. He's, he tells Abraham, yeah. this is your covenant. I'm giving it to you. But interestingly, he goes beyond that. It's not just a land covenant for Abram. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a people covenant. It's right. a, you're, you were a father, but now you're going to be the father of many nations. Right. I'm making you bigger. And he tells him, I will curse. And which word is that one? He's using the word aror. You'll be bound I, up. I will curse those who curse. Kalalal. The, you. So now we have both the Hebrew words in the right. same verse. I will. In the Abrahamic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, Which right? Genesis so 12. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, in the covenant. Which is telling us, in other words, if anybody speaks evil of you, then I'm get, they're going to be bound up. Yeah. And full circle, we link in again to this, this bigger story of God from Genesis, this Abrahamic covenant, yep. into what's happening in our Parsha right now. Yes. That if anyone even speaks over you evil, they're going to be bound yep. up. But if, you're, if they bless you, then they're going to be blessed. And this is why we say those who bless Abraham or those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel that's will right. be cursed. It's a, it's the promise that God made to Abraham, yeah. which he will carry out. God is not a liar, that he should be mocked. He yeah. will tell the truth, and therefore we should obey this. And then so, another final. interesting thing to note is that in this uh, chapter 27, as they're giving, you know, putting these curses forth, mm -hmm. you know, the, they're going out, call a law. Then you have, it says, like the first one begins with, cursed is the one who dishonors his father or mother. That means bound up is the one who yeah. dishonors his mother and father. The word for, is arar there. Yeah. 
But interestingly, then all the people are to say, Amen. amen. Talk about amen. Because so amen, you is have a, a, amen is a word that just means uh, so be it. So it's an affirmation of it. And a lot of times we jokingly say we, we throw amens around, you know, kind of like they're going out of style. We'll say negative things mm -hmm. like, you know, I really hate my life. Amen. You know, I mean, it's just like, we just, <laughs> I don't know what that, when we say so be it, we're asking God to make this a real, yeah. it's like almost a vow kind of statement. I want this, right? And so when we say amen, it's an agreement. So be it. Let it be so. If you say, God, I must do this, and if I don't, this will happen. Well, amen. I agree right. that I will take the penalty if this does. You have made a covenant vow with God. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to honor my father and mother, and if I don't, I'm cursed. Amen. Okay. I'm in agreement you with You agreed your... to be cursed then. Yeah. You asked to be cursed if you don't honor your father and mother. And that's what they do in 27. Which, they all agree to that. Which in essence is what we really should say is that I agree, God, that you are just. Yep. Your system is just. And when I go against your word, I agree that justice will occur that if i if i'm disciplined by the father it's in a justice and it's and i agree that i should be disciplined if i'm wayward yeah. and what is the discipline about it's to draw us back mm -hmm. all the things god doesn't give these disciplines as a mean disciplinarian mm -hmm. who's just exerting his dominance and his power over us it's because he knows when we walk outside of his ways we're not blessed. And what is the blessing? It means we don't have the provision. And when you read through in, in chapter 28, yeah. the blessings of God and, and versus the curses, you see that what God desires is for our health to be good, our land to be good, our children to be blessed, our crops to be blessed. Everything mm -hmm. is to be blessed. And why is that? Because it brings glory to him as we walk in the obedient following of his word and his ways yeah. the land is blessed yeah. the people are blessed and god is honored and glorified so i think as we we step back and we look you know sometimes when bad things happen in my life sometimes i stop and evaluate is this because of disobedience mm -hmm. did i do something that stepped outside of god's rule is it just because I live in a broken world and these, this is just part of the, the brokenness of mm -hmm. the world? Well, then I need to run to God, my strong tower, and let him yes. be my defense. Is this because um, of any number of things? I always try to evaluate yeah. what is happening and where I have fault in it to repent. To take advantage of that, Lord, I didn't honor my mother and father, or I didn't, I didn't, I moved my neighbor's boundary yeah. stone, as the next one says, or I did whatever it is, yeah. whatever, and I deserved this curse. But I'm asking now for that sacrifice on top of you all. I'm yeah. asking God that 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 sacrifice that you made for me yeah. will cover this sin, Amen. that I can be back in alignment <laughs> with Mount Gerizim, yes. with the blessings of God. Amen. So as a final thought today, as we close out, I encourage you to read chapter 28. It's quite interesting. It's a big blessing. But one thought that we don't usually talk about very often when we read this, there was a movement that came out years ago, and I just read this past week. Uh, it's making a comeback, and it was called the Prosperity Movement. And it was the idea that, you know, all of us under Yeshua are blessed, and we're blessed beyond, and therefore we will be blessed coming and going. We're the head, we're not the tail. Our, our health is perfect, our land is perfect, everything we do is perfect, we're totally provided for. We must have, and we are, we are given prosperity, period. And many times the prosperity preachers have used chapter 28 of Deuteronomy as their proof text for this. The problem is, Chapter 28 of Deuteronomy is designed to be in conjunction with chapter 26, 27, and all the rest of them. And it's designed to be when you, Israel, go into the land and possess it, then these things will come mm -hmm. upon you. And also there's curses that come upon you. Now, the prosperity movement doesn't like the curse part, so they don't even talk about those. So, right. And we make these individual promises, which they are to a degree individual, but the goal is the community Absolutely. comes together. And as a community, when there are people who are disobedient, we challenge them. We hold them accountable. We bring right. them back into repentance through the sacrifice on Ebal and say, you're going to be, not you, but the, the sacrifice of blood we'll will go you. for you. And now come in repentance. And if you don't come in repentance, we're going to put you out of our midst. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be here. Because be we want the blessing. Israel. You're going to be cut off from Israel yeah. because, hey, 
You can't be part of us if you're going to walk in that sin because all of these blessings are about the community. Right. And what they realized was we're required to hold each other accountable yeah. and hold each other up to a place where saying, no, you can definitely have grace. You can be forgiven. You're not kicked out for sinning. You're kicked out for not repenting. If you'll repent and if you'll allow the grace of God through sacrifice, then stay in the midst, stay with us yeah. and, and be here. And so as you read this, just enjoy it and look at the blessings, but don't just internalize them for your own personal edification. Remember, this is about the community of faith. That's exactly right. What and a take great it as a big point. picture. All right. You got anything final, I was thinking final thought about, as we yeah, close out here? I was thinking about the... Um, the the statement that you just made yeah. in uh, the Chronicles. Is it first or second Chronicles seven fourteen? Uh second. Uh second Chronicles seven fourteen. Well it could be. It could yeah. Be anyway, that says if my people would humble themselves and pray, mm -hmm. I will heal their land. Yeah, I will heal their What is it? It's about I will hear from heaven and heal their land. That is that idea of community. Yeah. If if my people Yeah will humble themselves. And I will hear and from pray heaven. and repent, yeah. So there's this, you know, even in, in, in Chronicles, there's this idea of community. Mm -hmm. Our Western mind has a really hard time seeing that because we don't live in that type of, of environment and understanding. But God is a God of community. God yeah. is a God of mishpacha. God is a God that invites us into his family and has a kingdom way that we live in that Amen. family. All right, so blessings to you and your community, and yes. and may the, uh, we hope this teaching has blessed you and hope you just get to grow and grow and grow in the Lord. Until we see you next time, God bless you, and shalom. Shalom.